Yeah. 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 Um, good morning, Dr. Langer. The Walking Book Club community welcomes you. I am excited to share your latest book, The Mindful Body, uh, with our global community as our October, November, December group selection. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you. Dr. Langer is a tenured professor at Harvard, where the Langer Lab researches health, happiness, decision making, education, business, and culture, all through the lens of mindfulness. Dr. Langer has written extensively on the illusion of control, aging, stress, decision making, and health without meditation. She is also a gallery exhibiting artist. Her books include Mindfulness, The Power of Mindful Learning, On Becoming an Artist, The Art of Noticing, Counterclockwise, and what we're chatting about today, her newest book, The Mindful Body. She is also considered the mother of mindfulness. So first question, how do you feel about that title? And that's fine. It's a nice child to have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the questions, um, instead of asking you which title is your favorite, because I feel that like that's asking you which of your children is your favorite. Mm -hmm. I won't ask that. And I'll instead ask, what are your favorite aspects of the latest book, The Mindful Body? Um, well, it's interesting. And The Mindful Body is because it's my last, you know, latest book, my favorite right now. Um, I think that what makes this book so different for me was that it started as a memoir and then became uh, similar to uh, mindfulness in that it's got lots of research, but it has all of these personal stories uh, to help um, uh, bring alive many of the points that I tried to make. I appreciate and have a little more insight in that it is somewhat of a memoir. So thank you for yeah. sharing. Um, in the Walking Book Club e-magazine, which accompanies our group selection to enhance our listeners' experience, by the way, your narrator was fabulous. Did you have any hand in picking her? And, uh, oh, yes, actually. Yeah, yes. she was great. Yeah, <laughs> let's start great. that over again. Yeah. Ask me that question again. <laughs> um, in the Walking Book Club e-magazine, uh, which accompanies our group selection to enhance the listeners' experience. I include several quotes from the book that were thought provoking on decision making and the illusion of control. I described the book to our community as part philosophy and part mind body research. How do you see the book? Um, I, I see it as important. <laughs> you know, the, um, the, the book essentially argues, well, let me give a little history first. In the distant past, the medical model claimed that um, psychology was essentially irrelevant. You know, I'm sure doctors at that point thought being happy was better than being unhappy, but to get a disease, what you needed was the introduction of an antigen. Then the world shifted a little, and now people know things like stress, which is psychological, um, are important to health. But people still talk about now mind-body connection. Um, I don't think it goes far enough. To me, we should be speaking about mind-body unity. And if you put the mind and body back together, then wherever you put the mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And that means every thought we have has an, uh, an effect on our health, every move we make. And so in this book, what I did was um, uh, present lots of the research we have um, providing evidence for mind-body unity. And some of them are really bizarre, but um, help make the point about how much control we actually have over our health. And I'll tell you about some of those if you're interested in a moment. But there's also a lot just about our thoughts. And one of the things that um, I, I like language and notice things that I think most people don't. So there, there are parts of the book that just have these strange things, you know? So let me give you an example. Uh, and part of this illustrates that while psychologists have taken us from down here to something better, there's a whole other place for us to go that's far more um, effective than most of us presume. So let's take the word try, for instance. Trying to do something is certainly better than thinking you can't do it, but the word try has built into it an expectation for failure. You don't try to eat an ice cream cone, you just eat it. So we do some cute little studies where we have one group trying to do the task, the other group instructed just to do it, and the doing group always outperforms. Mm -hmm. Hope, 
this sounds like a good one, right? We should hope. But again, hope has built into it an expectation for failure, subtle, but it's still there. See, at least for me, I get up in the morning and I go down to the kitchen uh, wanting a cup of coffee. I don't hope that I can get a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. I just expect that I'll be able to. The one that's the the most uh, strange, I think, um, it was I was asked many years ago to give a sermon at one of the Harvard churches. I, I'm not religious, so I'm think, I said yes because I say yes to almost everything. Um, and I think what what I don't know anything about religion, but I come up with forgiveness. It sounds sort of religious like, and maybe I could get away with it. Well, I start thinking about it, and I realized the strangest set of things, I come up with something that's almost sacrilegious. So very simple. You ask 10 people, is forgiveness good or bad? They're going to tell you what? It's good. If you ask 10 people, is blame good or bad? What are they going to tell you? It's bad. But you know, you can't forgive unless you first blame. And do you blame people for good things or bad things? Well, you blame people for bad things. But things in and of themselves are neither good nor bad. So what we have are the people who see the world negatively, who blame and then forgive. And my feeling was that's hardly divine. Um, and the alternative, to, I mean, it's, of course, if you're going to blame, it's better to forgive than not. But there's a different uh, a way of dealing with the whole issue, which, and this is something that uh, many of the things that I've done, and you know, I've been doing this for 45 years, but this to me was so important, was realizing that behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective, or else the person wouldn't have done it. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know, today I'm going to be a bigot, clumsy, and stupid. I mean, so what are they intending? And when we look at the behavior from the actor's perspective, it always makes sense. So you might not like me um, because I'm so uh, gullible, which I am. But that's because from my perspective, I'm trusting. Mm -hmm. And Julie, you get on my nerves because you're so inconsistent. But that's because you're flexible. Mm -hmm. And so every single negative way of understanding somebody's behavior, which is mindless, uh, when we open it up and ask, well, what sense can that make? Each negative has an equally strong positive. Mm -hmm. And so when you realize that, then you become less judgmental. You become less judgmental. You like yourself better. Your relationships improve. And all of that turns out to be good for your health. So I said to you, a lot of the book is about mind-body unity. It's not just the way our thoughts affect us. Um, uh, in you know, with respect to our happiness, well-being, relationship improvement, and all of that, but there's a very direct effect. So the very first mind-body unity study was done many years ago. Um, I I call it a famous study, which you know would sound uh, immodest, except that if you watch The Simpsons Go to Havana, they describe the study. So that's that's my justification. But in this study, what we did was to retrofit a retreat to 20 years earlier. Um, and then we had elderly men live there for a week as if they were their younger selves. So we put their minds back in time, right? They spoke about past events in the present tense and so on. But for all intents and purposes and um, everything we were able to do was to say this was the 20 year earlier time. As a result of this, their vision improved, their hearing improved, their memory, their strength, and they look noticeably younger. And all of this happening without any medical intervention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was then. Now we have all the new studies. The next one, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I, I hope people will be interested enough and, and well, buy is, the mindful body. It uh, is one of my questions about yeah. the counterclockwise study and, um, I, I think you re referenced kind of replicating it with breast cancer a little bit. Yeah, we never got to do that, um, but we're, we're going to do it now um, virtually. You know, when we, I mean, there's a, a, a sensible reason for not doing it. Sure. I don't know that your listeners would care. <laughs> so let's just cut that part out. Right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, just so you know, that when we were doing this, first we were doing it in Mexico, getting the um, approval of a country, mm -hmm. and then of Harvard, it was just taking forever. Then the oncologist we were working with uh, changed locations to MD Anderson, now we were going to do it with MD Anderson. It, 
it, it was just a matter of uh, getting the go ahead that, you know, so I said, forget it. There's mm -hmm. not enough time in my life to do this. And now we want to do it virtually. Yeah. Okay. But you're not going to put any of that. So, in. Interestingly enough, I, I, as I was uh, prepping for today's call in looking at um, the clown clockwise study, and I read that they were trying to replicate it in Milan and the breast. They did replicate it in Milan. And were any women used in that? No, you know, it, um, it's interesting. When I first chose men to do the study, it was not because there was anything special. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe special things about men, but not uh, to choose them as participants here. Um, it was just too complicated to have men and women. Mm -hmm. And so we just chose men. We could have done with women. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's uh, no reason why it shouldn't work uh, equally well. The mm -hmm. study has also been replicated in the Netherlands and South Korea. Mm -hmm. And so the findings seem to be real and have been validated by all of these newer studies. Mm -hmm. So in the next study in that series, what we did was take women who um, are chambermaids. So it's mm -hmm. interesting because chambermaids, as you know, they're exercising all day long and they're cleaning, mm -hmm. but they don't realize that they're exercising because the Surgeon General says exercise is what you do after work and they're just too tired, okay? Mm -hmm. So all we did was take these women, divide them into two groups, and we teach one group that their work is exercise. Making a bed is like working or this and that machine at the gym and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we get lots of measures there. The two groups are not eating any differently. They're not working any harder. The only change, as far as we could tell, is that now one group sees their work as exercise. Mm -hmm. As a result of this, they lost weight. There was a change in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down just by changing their mindset. So now we go on uh, to the present so many studies, I don't know which to pick, but again, I encourage people to read The Mindful Body, but let me just choose one. Uh, this is a study on wound healing. Now, it would have been dramatic if I could create you know, a big wound, I mean, really hurt people, but of course, I didn't want to do this, and even if I were sadistic and wanted to, uh, the review committee certainly wouldn't let me. So we inflict a wound, a minor wound, but it's a wound nonetheless. And people are in front of a clock. Unbeknownst to them, the clock is rigged. So for a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. Mm -hmm. For a third of the people, the clock is going real time, uh, half as fast as real time. And for a third, it's real time. So it's going fast, slow, or what it is. And what we find is that the wound heals based on clock time, hmm. perceived time, not hmm. real time. Hmm. Um, and we have so many studies like this, all that make clear to me that we have so much control over our health um, that um, we haven't tapped that we're totally oblivious to. And so my goal with all of this is to show people um, you know, the control you actually have. And lots of this started for me when I was a little kid. Uh, you know, as I said, the book started as a memoir. So I was um, uh, married when I was very young. And at 19, I got married again, but you can read about that. Yes. And we went to Paris on our honeymoon. And we go into this restaurant and my then husband was much more sophisticated than I. And I had ordered a mixed grill uh, one of the items on the plate was a pancreas. And I said, okay, which one of these is the pancreas? He points to something. Mm -hmm. I'm a big eater. I eat everything with mm -hmm. gusto. Now comes the moment of truth. Now that I'm a married woman of the world, 19 going on 40, mm -hmm. I have to eat the pancreas. It's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. So I start eating it and I literally get sick uh, to my stomach. It's I, you know, can't, and he starts laughing. Mm -hmm. I say, why are you laughing? He said, because that's chicken. You ate the pancreas a while ago. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, something else that happened many, many years ago that also led me to this mind-body unity notion was that my mother had gotten breast cancer and the cancer had metastasized to her pancreas. Well, as you might know, that's the end game, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then one day, magically, it was totally gone. Mm -hmm. Now, how could that be? Medical science couldn't explain it. Uh, mind, body, unity can't explain it. And I think the spontaneous remissions 
uh, that there are so many more than people realize. And if if you thought that whatever you have could totally leave, I, that would be very uplifting for people. And you'd organize yourself as a healthy person rather than see mm. yourself as somebody just about to, to die. Um, what I really appreciated about the book, or I mean, I appreciate it a lot. I have some resonance. All of it, all of it, Julie. Yeah, yes, all of it. <laughs> oh, but when you mentioned that specifically, the diff when you were talking about labels and if your sugar is 99 versus 101, you're not pre-diabetic and you're- Yeah, yeah so this, this um, I, we, call, we like call this the borderline effect. Mm -hmm. And this is more evidence. I mean, there's so many things mm -hmm. in this book. I, I wish I had the time to talk about all of it, but the borderline effect also um, supports mind body unity. Mm -hmm. So let to make it clear to people, let's mm -hmm. say um, Julie and I, you and I both take an IQ test and you get a 70 and mm -hmm. I get a 69. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, that means, because that's the cutoff point that you're normal mm -hmm. and I am cognitively deficient, what we used to call retarded. Now, no one in their right mind would think that there's a meaningful difference between the scores of 69 and 70. I could have sneezed, misread the question right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, as soon as we're given the label, our lives unfold in very different ways. So that right now we're the same, mm -hmm. but I would say probably even three months time, very important differences are going to be seen between the two of us, All right? Because now I'm cognitively right. In trouble. Um, this is the case for every illness. We take all sorts of medical tests, and there's, and no matter how you combine the tests, there are always people who are right below the cutoff point and those right above it. <coughs> Excuse me, which means at time one, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. We go out in time, and there is a difference. Mm -hmm. And that difference then is produced by our psychology. Mm -hmm. All right. So we did this with cancer, diabetes. You can do it with virtually, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. um, and people, you know, we've all had experiences like this. I mean, even if you're, uh, you go shopping and you read the label and it says a donut is going to expire in 10 minutes, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, clearly, uh, not donut. clearly, but I would guess you're not going to get sick or even notice the difference if you eat it 10 minutes after its expiration date. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a thought. Oh, as an aside, um, I, it just kind of came to me that um, when we have a group selection, I pair it with a charity because um, mm -hmm. that's what I need in my life to help drive. That gives me a sense of sure. purpose. So this round, it's for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Um, not only is it October, but the kind of the epiphany right now of um, you know, the, I wonder if the Breast Cancer Research Foundation is doing anything in terms of the mindset of yeah, kind of I don't know, but read right through instead of the medical, how about the mental? Yeah, well, um, there's um, something else we studied with respect to breast cancer. You know, um, I went to see a friend who had a very bad case of cancer, and I asked her how she was because she had just come back from one of the uh, from Mass General or wherever, and she said she was in remission. And at that moment, a, a light went off in my head. I said, "Wait a second! If I took the very same test." presumably they tell me I don't have cancer. Why is it I don't have it, but you have it in remission? Mm -hmm. You know, and that uh, remission, of course, this is like the linguistic things I was talking about before. Um, remission is, of course, better than the cancer being active, but it's not nearly as good as seeing yourself as cured. Mm -hmm. So they had this five-year rule, which is really not based on very much. And so if you're in remission for five years, then you can see yourself as cured. Mm -hmm. And that means for five years, women are stressed and stress is bad mm -hmm. for your health. Mm -hmm. um, so we did a little study where we went, uh, we spoke to women who were on a breast cancer awareness walk, and we simply inquired whether they saw their cancer as cured mm -hmm. or in remission. Just one word, but it has such different connotation. And then we followed them up and six months later, we found those who saw their cancer is cured were better both physically and psychologically on every measure we took.
Now, you know, um, if you have cancer and it's gone um, and then cancer comes back, you can see it as the same cancer. That's why you call it cancer. There's something similar. Or you can see it different. It's never going to be exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And um, if you recognize the difference, then you're empowered in a certain way. You know, you get a cold and the cold goes away. You don't see the cold as in remission. It's hiding there. You get the, another cold, um, which mm-hmm. is the same cold in some ways, which is why we call it a cold, but it's also different. Mm-hmm. And I think that we would prosper enormously um, anybody whose cancer is in remission to see themselves as cured. And then you just go on and live your life. And if you live your life standing tall, feeling good, um, being out there in the world, being mindful, um, you're improving your health, regardless of what ultimately happens to to any of us. And you know, Julia, there's something that we didn't say that I think people need to understand because when I talk about being mindful, this is mindfulness without meditation. Mm-hmm. Meditation is good, and I, I, you know, but right. this is just different. And mm-hmm. to, me- to meditation, what you do is you sit quietly and you repeat a mantra. So there's a practice mm-hmm. that results in post meditative mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Mindfulness, as I study, is much more direct. It's the I very sim- the very simple process of noticing new things. Mm-hmm. Why new things? Because you don't notice old things because you think that you know them. Mm-hmm. And it turns out since everything is always changing, everything looks different from different perspectives, we can't know anything. And, um, you know, and so most of us, at least women, know they don't know, but they think they're supposed to know. So they pretend, they hide, they take a step back. Mm -hmm. Uh, So let me free everybody. Nobody knows. You can't know for sure. And so I often start talks with something very simple. What is the thing we think we know best that we learned when we were little kids? So how much is one in one, Julie? Oh, I, I can go to the book. Okay, don't go to the book, just pre, pre-book knowledge. You would say two, but I read That's right. the book. Okay, so, um, and, you know, uh, so we think we know this mm-hmm. for sure, yep, but yep. it turns out that one in one isn't always two. Yep, if yep. you add one pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry, one plus one is one. One cloud plus one cloud, uh, one watt of chewing gum plus one watt. In the real world, one mm-hmm. plus one probably doesn't equal two as often as it does. Mm -hmm. So now if, and this is a remote possibility, but after we finish speaking, Julie, you run into somebody and say, hey, Julie, how much is one in one? Mm -hmm. Now, instead of mindlessly answering two, Mm -hmm. um, you'd stop, you'd pay attention to the context, um, and you'd probably answer, it could be two, Mm -hmm. which is very different. Mm -hmm. So the point is that once we think we know, we don't pay any attention. Uh, there's no reason to pay attention. And by not paying attention, we're giving up all of the benefits uh, that would otherwise accrue to us. Um, Mm -hmm. When we sit up and notice the neurons are firing and and it's literally and figuratively enlivening. So much research that we've done where this act of noticing, you live longer. Mm -hmm. Act of noticing, you light up and people think you're charismatic and trustworthy and they just like you better. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you're mindful and you're doing whatever you're doing, it actually leaves its imprint in the product you're creating. And it's easy. Not only is it easy, it's the essence of fun. You know, that um, Hmm. a a joke is only funny when you're surprised by the ending. Mm -hmm. And if you just, if you like word puzzles and you just did a crossword puzzle, that can be engaging, Um, but you don't want to do it again where you know all of the answers. So it's the going from not knowing to knowing Mm -hmm. uh, that sets us up to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And so if you think of mindfulness as engagement, Um, and easy to become engaged, Mm -hmm. I I can't see any reason why anybody wouldn't quickly um, try to to be mindful all the time. And so when I say that to people, be mindful all the time, some people shudder, oh my God, that sounds so hard. Mm. It's not, it's easy. It's the, it's what you're doing when you're having fun. Could you have fun all the time? I I know I could. Um, And so um, I think that 
uh, and people, I think the reason that people think being mindful is hard is because they confuse it with thinking and thinking has gotten a bad rap. Mm. Thinking isn't hard. What makes thinking unpleasant for people is the worry that they're not going to think it through correctly. They're mm. going to get the wrong answer mm -hmm. um, and so on. But um, mindfulness is what we do when we're at play. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I, you know, somebody will give me an example, say, okay, look, you're in the park, you have a little kid with you, let's say a, a, a three-year-old, um, and the three-year-old wanders into the street, isn't it better to mindlessly just grab the child um, to get them out of harm's way? And so my response to that is first, um, the child, if you were mindful, the child wouldn't have ended up in the street in the first place. Mm -hmm. Second, that you can tell, um, not all the time, but often, uh, which way a car is headed, turning, right? And if you're there for it, you can pull the child in the right direction rather than put both of you um, in, the, in harm's way, all right? So um, it's, you know, people think, well, being mindless is faster. And I'm not sure that it is, uh, but if it is, it's only nanoseconds. And, and when does that really matter? And, you know, so my belief is if you're going to do something, it doesn't matter what you're doing, show up for it. Mm -hmm. Because when you're not there, and the problem is when you're not there, you don't know you're not there. So <laughs> that mm -hmm. creates its own set of problems. But when you're not there, the system is actually, the system being the body, is actually turning itself off. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so we have, um, it's fun. It's easy, um, it results in better products, it results in better relationships, it results in a longer, happier, uh, healthier life. So if I kind of loop back around and I said I described the book when I was doing some promotion for it, early promotion yeah. for it, I described it as uh, part philosophy, part mind, body, education. Now I would say I would describe it as an overlap not, you know, parts, but it really an overlap to me. Yeah, no, it's all about, you know, yeah. mind body unity. So anything that's relevant to the mind, stress, uh, success, um, it doesn't matter what. I mean, I don't know that there's really anything that isn't related to uh, to mind body unity. But, I, I, yeah, go on, I'm sorry. And part of it for me was you pose provocative questions and provocative thoughts. Um, if if there's no right or wrong. Um, and I really enjoyed that aspect when I went into it with the thinking that it was, you know, simply about the studies on mind, mind and body yeah. together. Um, I would also now add that uh, it, it pulls from a little, not a little, but you know, that, that it is part memoir. So now I would describe it a little differently. Yeah, it's... Um... It, it's just about waking up and that the way waking up um, has uh, an enormous effect on every aspect of our lives and how we've got so much wrong. You know, it's interesting because I think um, psychology often is from the observer's perspective. So people seem to be doing bizarre things that they shouldn't do. When you look at why they might be doing it, everything changes. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for instance, decision-making. And I, I spend a lot of time talking about mindful decision-making because decision-making is very stressful for people. Mm -hmm. What if they don't make the right decision? Mm -hmm. um, and so the experts often say you should do a cost-benefit analysis, and that's fine, mm -hmm. except it makes no sense because every cost is also a benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I said to you, do you want to meet my friend Susie? She's very uh, spontaneous. You'd say yes. Mm -hmm. If I say, do you want to meet my friend Susie? She's very impulsive. You'd say no, but spontaneous and impulsive are the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it, it, it's a little complicated to describe it. It's, I think I spell it out pretty simply in the book, but mm -hmm. to to give a quick overview, uh, but decision-making relies on our being able to predict mm -hmm. because you look at these options and you remember the last time you did A and how that felt and B or C mm -hmm. and, you know, and so on. And mm -hmm. prediction is an illusion. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why you probably thought of philosophy. I, I don't see it as philosophy, but certainly something to stop and think, think twice about. about. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, people think they can predict because they're so good at postdicting, you know, what we call money, Monday morning quarterbacking. So um, I don't know why this example keeps coming to mind, but I know why, because it, I said it once, and so I keep saying it. But let's say you're at a party and John and Mary are fighting. If right at that moment I said to you, Julie, you think they're going to get divorced? You'd say, why? I mean, people fight. Mm -hmm. um, now, let's say we don't have that discussion. You see John and Mary fighting. Mm -hmm. um, and then two weeks later, you find out they're getting a divorce. Ah, I knew it. You should have seen them go at each other at the party. So going forward, we have no idea what's going to happen. Looking back, it's easy to, uh, to make a nice story that leads us to believe we should know when we can't know. Mm -hmm. Now, um, um, you know, and you can see how prediction is important to decisions. Um, mm -hmm. If you do a cost benefit analysis and every cost is a benefit, every benefit is a cost, it's going to add up to zero. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I think the argument is reasonably convincing in the book, but let me just cut to the chase and give people the bottom line, and which uh, is going to sound strange, but nevertheless, I deeply believe it. Rather than waste your time stressing over making the right decision, instead of worrying about making the right decision, make the decision right. I, I we can't know. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't know. Um, and if we can't know, then we can't make a sensible decision. Mm -hmm. But after the fact, we can make everything work out for us. So mm -hmm. I take my graduate students in a seminar at Harvard and I say to them, OK, let's test this. Spend the week not making a decision. You know, use some rule that the first alternative that occurs to you is what you're going to choose or the last or, you know, uh, flip a coin, roll dice, wh whatever it is. But don't go through any um, cost benefit analysis. And they know that if somebody comes and says, Julie, can I cut off your arm? I need an extra hand. You know, they're going to say <laughs> it's no. a little common okay. sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so um, they spend the week not making decisions and then they come back and everybody had a stress-free week, hmm. um, or, you know, supporting the idea mm -hmm. that uh, now you say, how can you make anything work for you? Well, um, once you recognize that events themselves are neither good nor bad, events are nothing. It depends on the way we frame the event, the way we understand the event. Mm -hmm. And there's always a way to understand it mm -hmm. to make it work for you. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, and for the kind of life that most of us are living, this is pretty easy, but some, one mm -hmm. of your cynical listeners might say, well, yeah, you know, uh, for the big things, I mean, are you saying that it doesn't matter if you live or, you know, mm -hmm. sure. and I actually can speak to that, but I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to now, um, let me give people another one liner that I think, uh, at least according to to my friends, because they take this and they put it on their refrigerators. Um, you know, it's a stress reducer. So when something happens and you're, you're about to get crazy, or you get crazy, take a breath. And if you just say to yourself, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? Mm -hmm. And almost always, mm -hmm. you know, you realize, yeah, okay, so you missed the bus, you burnt the food, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't finish the project. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, most of the things that people get crazed with are really only inconveniences. Yeah. I just pulled out of the garage and took the side of my car. And, yeah. And, and so what? You know, upset, but after I calmed down, I was like, it's just a car. It's that's right. But not only that, Julie, so what I do, and I don't know if this would work for people or not, but if something like that happens, so let's say if I bang my car, mm -hmm. I would get what was banged fixed, mm -hmm. but I would also use the opportunity to fix something else in the car. So that at the end, it was a good thing that I banged up the car because now the, you know, um, well, the brakes are better. Or something. The car was new, <laughs> which made it. <laughs> what? I said between you and I, the car that I took beside was brand new. <laughs> so, but I did oh. have to calm myself down. <laughs> and I realized it was just 
an inconvenience and that's well and one of the, one of dirty. the yeah but one <laughs> of the advantages than. one of the advantages of having you know banged the new car is that now you can drive um <laughs> more easily you know we have this thing any scratch is going to be yeah, yeah, you know, catastrophic yeah. i just didn't um, i just hoped it was a little later on but whatever <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I, I we're coming close to the time and I really want to be respectful. I've got two two more questions for you. One, um, you mentioned in the book about a Adam Grant, and we also brought forward uh Think Again, um, his his not his latest book, but the one before that. So I thought it was um, you know, a book to book connection of your mm. and think again. And I really liked his book too. It was very thought provoking. Mm. Um, but as I would imagine that's a proud professor moment for you. Um is there anything that you are... Adam was my student? Yes, yeah, yeah, because Adam yes. was your student. Yeah. So I have a, a proud professor moment for um seeing your students succeed and be published and all of that. Uh I mean, I would imagine your students are doing lots of things, which leads yeah. me to my next question. Is is there anything going on in the Langer lab that you can share with us that excites you? Oh, everything. <laughs> You know, I, mean, I, I wouldn't know where today, to begin let's to say, say what, today. what are the studies we're doing now? Um, too many for me to, uh, to list. Uh, they'll be reported in my next book. But one that's kind of fun that I allude to um, in uh, The Mindful Body. Um, when I was young, uh, I, I guess I was about 15 or whatever, and I had a, a close friend who was 17. And I would go visit her all the time. I lived in Yonkers and she was in the Bronx. And um, you know, because she was older, it made sense to my, to my young mind that she should be deciding what we do mm. every day, okay, mm. every visit. And uh, invariably, we would go for um, a hot fudge sundae or a banana split. She would eat it. I was always on a diet. And what happened was the strangest thing that while she's eating it, I, in some sense, am, am eating it with her mm -hmm. in my head. Mm -hmm. And so when she's done, I'm full. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what we're doing is um, it, my students told me a while ago that there are these videos online, you know, it's amazing to me what kids are watching, but they're called mucks or something like that. And they're just videos of people eating pizza. Okay. Uh, Why somebody's insane. watching this, I have no idea. So we use it in a study where what we have um, as one group mm -hmm. are actually eating it with them in their minds, imagining smelling it, chewing it and so on. Okay, so remember mind body unity mm -hmm. that imagined eating is is very similar to real eating. Mm -hmm. um, another group is just counting the number of chews. Okay, okay. so we're controlling for uh, how engaged they seem to be in watching the video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I don't have the results yet, but we'll see if imagined eating leads to weight gain, mm -hmm. weight loss, or if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was your age, I remember that people used, to, women used to say, I just have to look at a donut to gain mm -hmm. weight. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see uh, what happens. So we have fun studies like that. We have many more health studies. Mm -hmm. um, we have a part of the book that we didn't talk about and we don't have time now, but is attention to symptom variability, which is a procedure um, that we've used to basically cure all sorts of chronic diseases. And now we have some research going on with infertility. So, you know, it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, uh, it's great fun discussing with my lab all of these ideas. And um, most of them seem to pan out. So all I can say is wait and we'll see. Yeah. So the last question, uh, and I try and ask it of all of our guests on our Heart and Soul book chats. Um, the Walking Book Club is, the underlying motivation is to inspire um, greater wellness and well-being by encouraging movement um, mm -hmm. or help, it, helping people enjoy movement more um, and helping people find their health, what I call healthy body, happy mind formula and becoming more mindful of what it, it, they mm -hmm. need to thrive. So my question is to you, Dr. Langer, what are your ingredients that are non-negotiables for a healthy body, happy mind for you? Showing up. Okay. You know, 
that um, when, uh, if you recognize that uncertainty is the rule, not the exception, that nobody knows, that essentially makes everything new, everything potentially exciting. Mm -hmm. And so um, engaging, and whether it's on a walk, eating an apple, visiting with friends, it doesn't make any difference that if you're there and you're actively, you know, engaged in the conversation that will lead you to be happier and healthier as i said that mindfulness and all of its 45 years of research um, has shown itself to be literally and figuratively enlivening well thank you so much for showing up today uh like i said it was a real treat to um with a mindfulness expert. You're a celebrity to me, so I really appreciate it. And I will edit the video for snippets and um, promote the book. I believe in it. I think it's something that uh, is valuable to everybody. Thank you very much, Julie. I, so, I, <clears throat> and you'll keep doing it, right? Right, yes. Through the end no, of the month, I have, I, gosh, I put together, um, it's a full page that I offer in the walking, the e-magazine of stickers. Cause I think, you know, the prompts that you can put in your journal that say mm. um, like uh, uh, add more life to your years, not years to your life. Yeah. Um, and some of the uh, snippets that you have um, are already shared. So there are, I don't know, 30 of those that'll go out over the next couple of months in Great. to these snippets, which I'll, I'll, I'll put down and um, more information that really it, in my work ties beautifully to what you're saying, like the whole idea of neat energy, non-exercise active thermogenics. Um, I really try and tell people that that is a huge component of your health. So embrace right. it. You've talked about that and shown it with the, the chambermaid study. Um, and also, you know, just how important the way you phrase things when people share their right. goals, we try not to have the negative in it, you know, right. and, and right. crazy positive. So there's a lot that that I can pull from and add to and enhance in addition to promoting the book and using these snippets. So Beautiful. With much gratitude. Thank, thank you very much. This was a very special morning for me. And I will let you go because I know you're a busy woman. That's right. I'm a busy woman. Yeah, I have another podcast you. in yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much. It, okay, Julie, stay well. This was you fun. Too. Thank you. Thanks for showing up. Hey, <laughs> bye now.